Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. <clears throat> I want to welcome you this week to our midweek video and to our YouTube channel here. Grace Life Bible on YouTube, we're glad that you have tuned in with us and joined us here for our midweek uh, study. If you haven't already done so, if you would consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bells so that you can stay current with the ministry, both when we go live from the Assembly Building on Sunday mornings and when we create content for you here midweek, we would certainly appreciate you being a permanent part of our audience. We're featuring currently uh, my new online store, the Grace Life Press, gracelifepress.com. This website and online store now features all of our books, currently all seven of them that we have available for print and sale over the internet. Uh, we are continuing to work on some more things here. It just takes time to uh, get things ready to be printed. But we're excited about this website. If you haven't checked it out, gracelifepress.com, please do so. And from here, you can order directly any one of our books that are currently in print. Also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. We established this uh, last year as an alt tech site to YouTube should something happen to our YouTube ministry. We're up to 241 subscribers here. So if you're into alt tech sites or would like an alternative to YouTube, please consider uh, joining us here on Rumble as well. So what am I going to talk about this week? This week is going to be a continuation of what we did last week in my midweek video which I had titled down here, Why Grammar Matters. God was in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.19, Understanding the Imperfect Tense. So I want to go another step with that. I kind of previewed this, that I would be doing this uh, at the very end of the video from last week. So I'd like to go a little bit further with what we were looking at last time. Now, I'm not going to reteach everything from this video from last week here on um, God was in Christ. I want to move forward with that but we will just briefly review. So we started by evaluating the context, starting with uh, verses up here, probably about verse 13, but for the sake of time, verse 16, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So we talked about the need to be in Christ. Only those who are in Christ are a new creature for whom old, old, old things are passed away and all things have become new, only for those who are in Christ. Okay? And all things are of God who hath reconciled us. That would be those who are in Christ in the previous verse, to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. And again, notice the ED. Notice the past accomplished fact of reconciled. Those who are in Christ are reconciled. Those who are not in Christ are not reconciled, okay? And those who are have been reconciled because they're in Christ and are therefore new creatures for whom old things are passed away and all things have become new, they've been given the ministry of reconciliation in the context. Then we talked about verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, and we talked about the imperfect tense here on the word was. We talked about how was is a verb, we talked about how the imperfect tense in Greek and English signifies an event that started in the past and continues into the present, okay? And so God is still in Christ reconciling the ING, present tense. So the present tense, so God still today in the dispensation of grace is in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Only those who have trusted the finished work of Jesus Christ, who have by faith believed in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ as the only payment for their sin, only they can be said to be reconciled, okay? So we talked about the imperfect tense here on was, the present tense on reconciling, and we talked about what all that meant in the last video. So just to suffice it to say, the was is in the imperfect tense. We made a comparison with John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. We talked about how all three of those wases in John 1, 1 are also in the imperfect tense. They are not talking about past singularities. They're talking about activity and action regarding Christ that continues into the present. Okay. So the same is true here. God was in Christ at the God was in Christ. Now I almost subconsciously said at the cross, but the verse doesn't say at the cross. It says to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. The was in the imperfect tense is signifying that this is an ongoing action that started in past time that is continuing into the present, thus the ing on reconciling, which is also present tense, right? 
So we went over that. All right, now I want to talk about this next clause here, not imputing their trespasses unto them. All right. So if this is reconciling present tense, what is this? So let's let's look at that first. So let's jump into the tools here and look at what we can see here. So again, let's just review. Here's was. It's a verb in the imperfect tense. Here's reconciling. It is a verb in the present tense, active voice, which means it is still going on. Who is reconciling the world on himself, not imputing. Notice again, this is a present tense verb, not imputing. Imputing is in the ing because it is an, it is a present tense action. It is a present tense verb, okay? So I'm going to turn this off so that we can just go back and look at the verse without the distractions here provided by the tools. Not imputing. Now, the first thing you need to realize is this is an ing because of the flow of the verse. He was in Christ in past time, continuing into the present, in the process of reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. All right, imputing. Let's talk about the word imputing first. All right, now let's, well, I shouldn't have turned the tools off so quickly. Let's look at it here first in the underlying language, okay? So, yes, we're going to look at a Greek word because the reason the King James translators translated it imputing is because of what the word means in its base, okay? So, we can see the occurrences. This word occurs 41 times. The Greek word is translated 41 times by the King James translators. Think nine times, impute eight times, reckon six times, count five times, account four times, suppose two times, reason one time, and number one time. Notice that the word is never translated forgive. It is never translated forgive by the King James translators. Now that is a fascinating thing considering those who want to say that the King James translators have already quote Greeked the Bible for you. It is never translated as forgive, all right? So it's all it's translated as imputing, imputing in this verse. So to what does it mean to impute? To reckon, to count, uh, to compute, to calculate, to count over, to take into account, to make account of, to number among, reckon with, to reckon or account, uh, to reckon inward, count up or weigh the reasons, to deliberate by reckoning up all the reasons, to gather or infer, to consider, to take account, to weigh, to meditate on, suppose, deem, judge, determine, propose, decide. Notice that the word forgive is not listed there, okay? We could go to the uh, American Dictionary of the English Language by Noah Webster. Impute is a verb. Number one, to charge, to attribute, to set, to account of. Generally ill, sometimes good. We impute crimes, sins, trespasses, faults, blame, etc. to the guilty persons. We impute wrong actions to bad motives uh, or to ignorance or to folly and rashness. We impute misfortunes and miscarriages to imprudence to attribute, to ascribe, to reckon to one that uh, to reckon to one what does not belong to him. And we have different definitions here of impute. Notice that none of them has anything to do with forgiveness. That word is not mentioned. Okay, we could go to the Oxford English Dictionary and we can look up the word impute and we could see again the forms of, to bring a fault or the like into the reckoning against, to lay to the charge of, to attribute or assign. Okay. Uh, and then in theology, number two, to attribute or to ascribe righteousness, guilt, etc., to a person by vicarious substitution, see imputation. So the word impute means to count. It means to reckon. All right. That's what it means. Now let's go back to the verse. Notice what the verse says. The verse says that God is in Christ, not imputing. So God is not counting. He is not, not imputing their trespasses unto them. So God is not reckoning. God is not counting. He is not attributing men's trespasses unto them, the world's trespasses unto them. This is a negative statement. Notice the not imputing. This is a statement of what God is not doing. God is not imputing their trespasses unto them. That is That doesn't mean, though, that God is automatically doing the reverse positive and forgiving people of their, of their sin and their trespasses. You're not forgiven, you're not reconciled, past tense, until you're in Christ. 
So this is a negative statement. Not imputing is saying what God's not doing. He's not counting or reckoning uh, their trespasses against them. That does not automatically mean that he has imparted forgiveness to them. It just means that he is not imputing their trespasses unto them. It is a negative statement in the present tense of what God is currently not doing. He's not imputing their trespasses unto them. Now, I'm going to use an illustration here. No illustration is perfect. But if I say I'm not playing football, that doesn't automatically mean that I'm playing baseball. It just means that I'm not playing football. All it is a statement of what I'm not doing. And that's what's going on here in this verse. Okay, so the, we could look at and find uh, imputation. If we search in the Blue Letter Bible, now I've already put it in, but if we search the word impute with the asterisk, it'll find every occurrence of the word impute in the King James Bible. Okay, and the first occurrence of any form of the word impute is here in Leviticus chapter 7, verse 18. Now, I have my Bible here, and if I go back, Leviticus chapter 7, the first, uh, let's see here, the first 10 verses are about the trespass offering. And starting at verse 11, he starts talking about the peace offering. And there's a bunch of stuff said about the peace offering, a bunch of restrictions that are given. Notice what it says. And if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings be eaten at all on the third day, it shall not be accepted, neither shall it be imputed, counted, reckoned unto him that offereth it. So if a guy offers this and he eats the flesh of the peace offering at all on the third day, it won't count. It will not count. It will not be reckoned to his account. He would have to do it over again. It's not going to be imputed unto him that offereth it. Now notice that imputation there is immediate. If you follow the rules and you offer the sacrifice right, there's an immediate imputation. If you don't and you eat of it on the third day, there's an immediate imputation in the sense that it is not reckoned. It is not imputed to him that offereth it. It shall be an abomination, and that soul that eateth it shall bear his iniquity. So if if so, there's an immediate imputation of punishment here for the soul in Israel that does not offer the peace offering correctly. There's an immediate meeting out of punishment according to the law for failing to do this, okay? Now, why is this important? This is important because the verse in 2 Corinthians 5.19 is talking about not imputing their trespasses unto them, okay? So what does that mean exactly? Well, in the law, we can see what it, whoops, in the law, we can see what it means here. It's immediate instantaneous. Now, this raises the question then, well, are is anybody today in the dispensation of grace under the law? Does the law apply at all to anybody, lost, saved, at, at all to anybody during this time period? Okay, And I think what we're going to have to conclude is the answer to that is yes. So look at in Romans chapter 3. Notice what Paul says. He says, what then? Are we better than they? No, and no wise, for we have proved before, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. In Romans 1 through 5, Paul is laying out the great argument for justification by grace through faith, and he starts with the, all the world being guilty before God and being under sin. So how is it that Paul can say that the whole world, Jew and Gentile, they're all under sin here in Romans chapter 3, and yet we have those who are saying that all the world is already forgiven and sin is no longer an issue or sin no longer separates the individual from God. OK, Paul says that they're all under sin now. And then he goes on and gives some uh, illustrations here. But notice now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. That, the purpose and the intent. Now, has Paul already concluded in verse nine that Jew and Gentile are all under sin? The answer is yes. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. How Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How does a lost man know that they're a sinner and they've fallen short of the glory of God. 
The way they know that is because the law testifies against them, that they're a liar, that they're a thief, that, that uh, you know, that they're a fornicator, that they're a adulterer or, you know, you know, so on and so forth on down the list. OK, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law for a lost man today, even in the dispensation of grace, testifies as a witness against that man that that man is a sinner and has fallen short of the glory of God, okay? Now, what God is choosing to do today in the dispensation of grace is not impute, not count, not reckon the penalty of these sins against a person now, against a person today during the dispensation of grace. He is not imputing their trespasses unto them. Now, that doesn't mean that they will not one day in the future, if they die in an unregenerate state, have their sins imputed or counted or reckoned against them. It just means that right now, that is not happening. So think about all of the terrible evil that is going on in the world right now, and people seem to be getting away with it. God is not instantaneously imputing the consequences of the law to people the way he was back here. Because he has opened a day and a time in this dispensation of grace for all men to be saved, and he's choosing not to impute their trespasses unto them. That doesn't mean, though, that they're not violating the law. That doesn't mean that the law is still not a testimony against them. That doesn't mean that the law is still not manifesting to a lost man the fact that they're a sinner and that they cannot save themselves, their work, their church going, their performance, their effort whatever it is, isn't going to, is not going to get it done before the bar of an almighty, just, righteous God. And so as a result, they come to a place where they acknowledge that they are a sinner, that they are under sin, and they reach out in faith to a redeemer. Now we could go back here to Romans 3. We've got verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being, there, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. You have to believe in the blood atonement, the blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross for your sin. And when you believe that, you have that atonement applied to you, applied to your own personal sin account. Okay. Now, we could also go to 1 Timothy, and we could see 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Notice, but we know that the law is good. See, the problem is not with the law. The problem is with us. The law is good if a man use it lawfully. So right away, that tells us that there is a lawful and an unlawful use of the law. There's an appropriate use and an inappropriate use. There's an acceptable use and an unacceptable use. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. So if you're in Christ, if you're saved, if you're justified, the law is not made for you because the law has done its job. It has brought you to a place where you acknowledge your sin and you reach out to a redeemer who paid the price and died in your stead. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners. The law is for sinners. The law is for people who are not saved. The law is for people who are still in their sin. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. That is how lost people come to understand that they're lost. And for sinners and for unholy and for profane, for murderers of fathers, for murderers of mothers, for man-stealers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel, the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. So the law is not made for a saved person. The law is not made for a just man. It's made for the lawless, for the disobedient, for the ungodly, and for sinners. So there is still a purpose of the law today, even in the dispensation of grace, and it is to convict and manifest sin, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. All the world, Jew and Gentile, are all under sin today in the dispensation of grace, and the law still applies to them in the sense of it manifests sin. This is what these verses clearly, clearly demonstrate. So this then gives us insight into the sense that God is not imputing sin today. He's not imputing their trespasses unto them. He's not immediately 
enacting the punishment that the law required for those trespasses because he has instituted a day of grace and peace. In 2 Corinthians 6, the next chapter, Paul talks about the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6, 1. We then as workers together with him beseech you also they receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in the accepted time, the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. God today is saving people by grace through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is not presently counting or imputing their trespasses unto them. But he will in the future if they die in an unregenerate, lost state outside of Christ. Okay? This is what Romans 2, Romans 1 talks about the Gentiles and how he gave them over to a reprobate mind. And if you look at the end of Romans chapter 1, let's just uh, click over there quickly. Let's go to the end of Romans chapter 1. We can see um, what Paul said there going into chapter 2. Look at what Paul says about these Gentiles, who said, who understand, uh, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God against them which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. The very act that God, through the Apostle Paul, would start the book of Romans by declaring judgment on the Gentiles for their sin is an act of grace. Because what it's doing, God long ago, back in Genesis 11, gave the Gentiles over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And they had never, before the Apostle Paul, had a God-sent apostle to them to tell them of their sin, to call them to change their mind, to call them to belief and faith in Christ. And so that is what Paul is doing here. He is warning the Gentiles about this. Now we can come to chapter 2 of Romans, the very next chapter, and we can see it right here. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doeth the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which doest such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? That's what God's doing today. He's forbearing and long suffering with these Gentiles, offering them a day of grace and peace, offering of them a day of salvation in which he is not imputing their violations of the law to them. But that's going to change. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, see, they're hard because they're not embracing the goodness, forbearance, and long suffering of God. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Folks, the lost today are treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. There is coming a day where they will have their sin imputed to them. It will be reckoned to their account, and they will be in eternal punishment for eternity. It's a gruesome thought. It's not fun to think about, but it is the reality. The sense that God, God is not imputing trespasses unto them today is part of the opportunity he is giving the Gentiles. So not only does this verse not say at the cross, the tense on the verb was is imperfect. It signifies a past action continuing into the present where God is still in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. He is currently not enacting the righteous punishment of the law that is deserved against sin, he has, he's, he's not imputing. He, that's what he's not doing. It's a negative statement. It's telling you what God is not doing. It does not mean that he is do, automatically doing the reverse positive and forgiving these people of their sins. It just means he is not counting them against them today because he is extending to them a day of salvation. And every day that goes by, 
that they don't take advantage of the goodness and the forbearance and the long suffering of God. They're treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. So, and we can see that here. Somebody pointed out in the comments to the last video to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us. That would be those who are in Christ. That would be those who are reconciled the word of reconciliation. So, we are to go and tell now here's the reality god has done his part okay he has paid the redemption price he has settled through the sacrifice of his son he settled the offended justice of god against sin has been settled and god has settled his irreconcilable differences with mankind and now he is taking us who are already reconciled ed He's given us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ that be reconciled to God. All of the world is not automatically reconciled to God. All of the world is not automatically forgiven. All of the world's sins are paid for. And we could go back here to Romans 3. Okay, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteous of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, for all have sinned. Over oh, Here's the verse I want. Even the righteous of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all. See, it's unto all. It is unto all men without distinction, Jew, Gentile, without distinction. But it is upon all. It's unto all and upon all them that do what? that believe. Belief is not a work, but to him that worketh not, but believeth, his faith is counted for righteousness. For there is no difference. So I think there's very incorrect teaching going around here on 2 Corinthians 5.19, and it is not grammatically accurate. It is inserting things into the verse that the verse doesn't actually say. Ironically, by those who claim to be the defenders of the AV are inserting things into these into this verse that the verse doesn't actually say. If they're going to be consistent with their reading of the word was, they're going to have to say the same thing about the Lord Jesus Christ in John 1.1. 1, 1. And so what we have here is an ongoing action that started in past time where God is still in Christ. He is still in the process, I-N-G, reconciling, active, present, the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. He is not enacting and imputing the just punishment of the law to these people because he's in his forbearance and grace and goodness. He's giving them an opportunity today through the day of salvation to believe. In the meantime, they are treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God who's going to judge them according to their works. So the grammar matters, folks, in how we interpret the passage. Now, if you've liked this video, if you would consider, if you would consider while well, subscribing and ringing the alarm bell, but if you would also consider liking, leaving a comment, sharing this video as a way to help get the word out about this uh, channel, we would certainly appreciate that. Before you go, just a couple quick reminders. First of all, we are rebroadcasting the Grace History Project here on this channel every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9 a.m., and uh, we're working our way toward the end here, uh, not too distant future. We'll have all of those uh, videos populated for you here in this playlist. I also want to tell you that at Sunday morning at 10, 1040 a.m., going live from the assembly building, we just started a new study on the book of Galatians, and I'll be bringing the fourth study in that series this coming Sunday. So you can still get in sort of at the ground level of this. I'll leave a link to this playlist also in the description for this video. We also have, folks, a new podcast episode. My wife and I have uh, recently, oh, getting ahead of myself. I want to talk about the live stream next. We live stream from our assembly building, 9 a.m. and 1040 on Sunday morning. So uh, make sure you can tune in. There's where you can uh, get the join us for Galatians at 1040 time slot, Eastern time, if you're interested. And we also have a new podcast episode, The Flesh, Why Believers Still Struggle. The Flesh, Why Believers Still Struggle. So we appreciate you tuning in. If you haven't already done so, we've given the gospel many times in this video, so we're not going to uh, uh, elongate the video. Trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your time.